Hello again, friends, and welcome to the Church at Lion of Judah Sunday, January 8th service. This week, we're blessed to have with us Rabbi Kurt Schneider joining us with his message, 2023 Vision. We're sure this message will bless you as we start the new year. Would you like to come see us in person? We're closer than you think. We're at 5732 Douglas Road in Toledo, Ohio. Service times are Sunday, 1030 a.m. and Friday at 7 p.m. If you'd like to join us in support of our ministry and outreach, drop in at www.lionofjudatoledo.org and click the Donate button. Hey, thanks for spending time with us today. We really appreciate it. Now on to the message. Shalom. God bless you. Good to be with you all today. I know many of us, as we enter into a new year, we kind of ask ourselves, is there something new that I should be looking towards? Is there something in my life that I should be aiming for? Is there some, I'm going to actually take the music off for today, if I could, please. Is there some change that the Lord wants me to make? Is there something new I need to do? That's where New Year's resolutions come from, right? People make changes in their diet. They say they're going to exercise more, but... Many of us are thinking about, is there a change I need to make? You're looking for a fresh vision for what God wants you to focus on as we're entering into 2023. And I want to talk about that with you this morning. And I think that you'll hear that what I have to share with you, it's not hype. It's not the New Year's hype. It's true foundational reality that the Lord wants to shape our heart with, that the Lord wants to move us into in a deeper way. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me one last time, and we're going to read a scripture together to begin to set the stage. We're going to go to the book of Philippians, Vision for 2023. We're going to read Philippians, the Word of God, chapter 3, verse 7. I think it's through 14. We'll continue through. The grass withers... And the flowers fade, beloved ones, but the word of God abides forever. It's living, it's active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul is speaking here as a model for us. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. So the first thing I want to say is if we want to gain more of Christ, which is the Greek word for the anointed one. In Hebrew, we'd say the Mashiach. If we're going to gain more of Christ, according to verse 7, there are some things that we're going to have to lose. So I'd first of all like to set the stage by saying that if you want more of him, there's going to have to be less of you somehow. He might require you to let go of some things that you're hanging on to because as long as you're hanging on to those things, you're not going to be able to progress in Him. Are you prepared and willing to do that? Talking about being willing to make a decision in life to set you free because people are clinging to the old and they're afraid of letting go of the old even if it's not satisfactory, even if it's a habit that's hurting you, even if it's a relationship that's keeping you bound and down. Many people will not make the decision to let that sledgehammer fall to break off the old so you can move forward in the new thing. And that in no way is meant to put down anything or anybody. It's just a decision of the master of breakthrough involves letting go to take a hold of. So Paul said, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. And sometimes there's things in our lives that are good for a season, but God wants to move us on to a new season. It doesn't mean the past season was bad. It just means that God's got something new. You've got to let go of the old to take a hold of the new. And then Paul continues, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of their surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I love this. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. As long as we're clinging to the world, as long as we're relying on someone or something rather than relying on the Lord, we're not going to be able to gain Christ. Fully. Fully. So again, Paul says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value 
of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. But are you convinced that Jesus is real? Because if we're not convinced that he's real, that he's who he said he is, that he's the source of life, he's the fruit of the vine, he's the one that, that sets us free, the one that empowers, the one that leads us from strength to strength, that brings us into a place where we're experiencing God's supernatural realities in our life. Unless we're convinced of that, we're not going to take action. But Paul was convinced. He said, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I might gain Christ. If we move on, please. And be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I might know him. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Yeah, if we're going to walk with Jesus, we're going to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. But let me ask a question, Lion of Judah. Are you and I willing to share with him in his sufferings? I don't meet a lot of people that are willing to do that. I really don't. Even Christian people. It's surprising to me how few Christian people are willing to suffer with Christ for their sake of identifying with Him. I mean, they just are so controlled by being accepted by people. They're so unwilling or unable or afraid of being hurt through rejection. But beloved, Jesus was rejected at times. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If we're going to go forward in 2022, we've got to recognize that to fulfill our calling, to fulfill, beloved one, your calling, you have to suffer some rejection. Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love you. But because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. But know that it hated me before it hated you. I'm just saying that if we're going to truly be the church, if we're going to truly be the end times entity that carries the presence of Jesus, the Messiah, on the earth, we got to be willing to be like Paul that suffered the loss of all things and just follow him. that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. What does this mean? It means that Jesus, somebody say, Jesus. Jesus. Yeshua. Yeshua. Yeshua of Nazareth. Oh, somebody's able to say three words in a row. <laughs> was obedient to the Father to the point of death. The Bible says because he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, therefore God highly exalted him and gave him the name above every name, that at the name of Yeshua, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So when Paul says that he suffered the loss of all things so that he'd be united with Yeshua in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, this involved being obedient even to the point of death. So we're starting to get some vision, I hope, for 2023. I'm going to spell it out more succinctly in a moment. But I hope that you're starting to see the big picture here. The world has a lot of bells and whistles and lights that they're showing us of what we should be going after. But if we're serious about pursuing the Lord, we got a vision for 2023 right here. Let's keep going forward. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And this next verse should come for us a bit. Paul said, not that I have already obtained it or have become perfect. But I press on so that I might lay hold of that which also I was laid hold of. By Christ Jesus. He wanted to lay a hold of the one that had laid a hold of him. 
Is your vision singular? Is Jesus your goal? Are you willing to pay the price? Do you know it's a blessing to suffer some things for him? And if we could continue on, please, with the two last verses. Brethren, I did not regard myself as laying hold of it yet, having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter how far you've come. I forget what lies behind, and I press on. I reach forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the call for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Please be seated. Father, I pray that right now that you might fuse our souls and minds to you. That you'd give us the grace to be single-eyed and single-minded, to pursue one thing in life and one thing only, Christ Jesus. I want to give you, first of all, five words. You might want to write these down. And then I'm going to move into three specific applications of how we can pursue the Lord this year and grow in our calling in a way that will truly bring powerful transformation to your life. I want you to know the word that I've got for you today, beloved ones, it's not just a word. If this word penetrates your soul and moves you into action and gives you a vision for the next year, you will be supernaturally, powerfully changed. First, I want to give you simply four words to keep in mind. Number one, vision. That's what we've been trying to do just now, create a vision for you. What is what you should be setting your focus on? Number two, after vision, focus. Sometimes we have a vision for people, probably everybody in here, as I'm reading through the book of Philippians, as I'm speaking of it, everybody in here that belongs to the Lord is in some way saying yes to this. In some way you're getting a vision for this. You're saying, I want this. But the challenge too often is, what Jesus talked about when he talked about the sower and the seed. The sower went out to sow the seed in four different types of ground. Do you know that every single type of ground received the seed? The first type of ground, the devil immediately came and snatched it. I see this happening many times. I speak into people's life. I see that when I'm speaking to them, they're coming alive. Ten seconds later, they can't hold on to it anymore. They completely lose focus. The devil takes it away. Other people say, yes, they've got a little bit more root, but Jesus said in some of the people, the distraction of life get them off focus. Other people, what happens is the cares of life get them off focus. The things of the world lure them away or the pressures of living crush the seed. But Jesus said the one that stays focused, the one that stays focused on my reality and clings to it, that person's going to bear fruit. So we need vision that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is real, that we can know him in the power of his resurrection, that we can experience a supernatural freedom, that we can have breakthrough in our lives. We've got to be willing to suffer for that. We've got to be willing to pay the price for that. But it's a reality that we can be have in this life. And we've got to stay focused on that reality. How do we stay focused? We stay focused, beloved ones, and these are just practical steps that you've heard many times. We stay focused by beginning the day with God. Because the way you start your day is going to determine the trajectory of the rest of your day. Start the day with God. Get up in the morning, put that worship music on, get your devotional, open the Bible, and spend as much time as God is speaking to you to do, but do it every morning and make no exceptions. Start the day with God. And then continue throughout the day with God. Talk to him all day long. Talk to him all day long. Talk to him all day long. In your heart. It doesn't have to be out loud. It's not, you invite him into every conversation. You invite him to guide you into every decision you're making. You recognize if your thoughts are drifting away, you pull them back. You start the day with God and you continue with God. You develop a supernatural awareness of Jesus in your life. And you walk in the fear of God. You walk in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Without the fear of the Lord, you will go astray. 
I'm not talking about just respecting God. I'm talking about fearing God. I'm talking about fearing God so that you fear sinning. Knowing that if you know him and you sin and you do not repent on your own, he will discipline you and it will oftentimes be harsh until you learn your lesson. We need the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord keeps us focused. When your heart begins to go astray and your mind begins to go astray, you recognize that if you allow yourself to think that way, judgment's going to come on you. We stay focused. Number three, and this goes with number two, we take action. We take action. We follow through. It, it, it means every day. Every day is a life of discipline. Uh, discipline's actually my next point. Every day is a day of action, and it's a life of discipline. Every day we're choosing all day long. We're choosing what we're listening to, what we're saying, what we're looking at, how we're spending our time. How many of you watch the YouTubes? You have a choice what you can watch on YouTube. You got a million options out there. What YouTube are you going to choose to listen to? If it doesn't build you up, if it doesn't give you knowledge that's at least neutral, when I say at least neutral, I mean if I watch a fishing video, that's not necessarily godly. I mean, it's not ungodly, it's neutral, but I'm learning something. If you're, if, if you're not learning something that's acceptable to the Lord for you to learn, or if something that you're watching isn't adding value to you in the, in the spirit, then don't watch it. Singular focus, taking right actions, what you eat. It does matter what we eat. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't hear about that much anymore. It matters what you eat. You're choosing how you're treating the Lord who owns your body when you choose what you're going to put in your mouth or not. Now, God desires us to get pleasure from eating. That's why he gave us taste buds. There's nothing wrong with having dessert. But if you're 300 pounds and 5'2", it's a good time to say no. And it's, 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 it's just balance. It's just, it's just, you can enjoy all things, but do it with discipline. Do it with balance. Take right action because all of you belongs to God. And then finally, as I said, discipline. I mentioned that already, but discipline. It takes discipline to, to live this lifestyle. I love the definition of discipline. Discipline is continuing to do what you said you were going to do after the feeling of wanting to do it goes away. It's walking in obedience when you don't feel like it anymore. It's staying committed to that time in the morning with the Lord is the first thing of your day when you feel isolated and separated from God, where you feel dry. You even feel inauthentic because you feel like you're... It doesn't matter. You stick with the discipline. You stick with the process. So once again, the four words to write down there, we're going to ch change tracks here. Vision. Focus, action, and discipline. So the Lord gave me that, first of all, several weeks ago. And I continue to look to the Lord to dig up from Him and in Him, from my soul and the Spirit. Lord, what is it? Give me specificity about what you want me to focus on this year and what you want me to bring to your, your, your people at Lion of Judah. And the Lord gave me three concepts. What should we really be focused on exercising ourselves in this year? Number one, love. Growing in love. Jesus said, all men shall know you by your love. A new commandment I give unto you, love one another. Jesus said, this is the greatest commandment to love God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Love is the greatest commandment. In this, Jesus said, the entire law is fulfilled. Now, when I think about this commandment, I think particularly of my relationship with other people, because that's really where the rubber meets the road. Some people say they love God, and they treat others like dirt, right? They don't really even see the disconnect there. So our love for the Lord is oftentimes fleshed out in the way that we treat other people. So how, how do we grow in our ability to connect and love other people? Number one, I think it's a practicing of coming out of just being aware of ourselves. 
Someone was sharing with me the other day, they went to see a family member and they hadn't seen the family member in, in a while and the family member even hardly realized that they were there because they were so focused on their, their technology. So loving people means that you call, you, 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 you wake yourself up to be aware of the people around you. And you, be, you, you come out of yourself to reach out to them. You come out of yourself rather than just talking about yourself. You come out of yourself, how are you doing? You show concern for them. You try to remember them. When you're sitting on your couch at night, maybe the Lord puts somebody on your heart. You're supposed to reach out to that person oftentimes. He send them a text, call them, do something. Be someone that's looking to love other people rather than just being trapped in yourself. Because as long as we're just trapped in ourself, we're really not allowing the Lord to live through us. Because we're a body. And the body is a, 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 an organism where each member is connected to each other, but we have to work at that. And then when I think about growing in love, I think about overcoming the flesh. And the flesh is impatience with people. I don't know if any of you struggle with impatience with people. I do. And I'm a person, as I've shared with you before, like I have an agenda. If I've got something set in my mind, and I, and I don't have the ability, like some people do, to be a multitasker. I really don't. Like if I see something and I'm doing that thing, I can't hear anything else. Anything else, if you start talking to me when I'm sending out an email to somebody, I will feel so agitated because I can't do both things at the same time. Other people can do that. I can't do it. So what I have to do is when... Things are coming at me that frustrate me or irritate me or agitate me because I'm focused on something and people are talking. Have to, I have to stop my frustration, my impatience, and treat that person with courtesy and respect and love and compassion, even though my emotions are impatient. And, and we have control over it. Just like on the road. You can be on the road. And someone's in front, you're, but you know what? You have the ability to say, no, I'm not going to let hate rule in my heart. You know, that person in front of me, I'm so agitated, they're going so slow. But we can say, you know what? Pull yourself back. So love, we grow in love. It's growing in consideration of people. It's tempering our emotions. It's initiating doing something to love people and show concern. It's giving. But we've got to stretch ourselves in love. We've got to grow in love. Not just something that we feel inside, something that we're doing because love is action. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And when we speak about the love that Jesus is calling us to grow in, remember, it's something that is not natural. There are certain people, we just love them, right? You don't have to try to love them, you just love them you, you, for whatever reason. Usually we love the people that make us feel good about ourselves, if you can do something for me, I love you. If you, for whatever reason, make me feel better about myself, I love you. Some people collect friends like they collect stamps. They're looking to add into their repertoire of friends someone that's good for their collection, that somehow elevates them. But Jesus said even sinners love their friends. That's not supernatural love. Loving people that are easy to love, that make us feel good about ourselves because we enjoy the socialization with them. Maybe they're like us. We share common hobbies, whatever. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about loving people who in the natural we wouldn't love. Jesus said, I've called you to love your enemies. That's supernatural love. So it means struggling in the spirit to overcome feelings and actions that would not be loving with those that we naturally don't feel drawn to and even dislike. It means overcoming that to show love to those people, even people that offended us. The natural reaction for many of us oftentimes when we're offended with someone, someone's hurt us, someone's wounded us, Someone did something that made us feel bad about ourselves. The natural inclination is for us to have what? Ill will towards those people. We don't want them to do good. 
We want to see them hurt. We want to see them suffer. We want to, we want to get the victory over them. Am I right? And so when we're having feelings like that, we have to say, Lord, deliver me, save me. I mean, I, I, I'm secure in my salvation. I think we should be secure in our salvation, but I also think we should fear the Lord. Lord, I don't want to go to hell. Yeah. You know, when we start recognizing ill will towards people, we need to pull ourselves back when we say, Jesus, save me. I want to be like you. It doesn't mean you have to be best friends with the people, but it means you can't, you can't have... You can't be trying. When you're sending out ill will in the spirit, you're potentially really harming people because there's something going on in the invisible realm. So we need to love. We need to, to, to struggle, to overcome, to love people, even if they've hurt us or wounded us, and keep ourselves from, from being ministers of evil. Remember Jesus' disciples, there were some people that were uh, doing some things that were contrary to what they were doing, and Jesus' disciples said, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Remember what Yeshua said? You don't know what spirit you're of. We want to grow in love. Number two, we want to obey. Number one, grow in love. Number two, obey. It's really all about obedience. I love in John 14 where Yeshua talked about experiencing the reality of the Father's love and of His Spirit resting in our soul, the indwelling reality of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said the key to experiencing the love of the Father and to having the Holy Spirit resting on your life, the key, Jesus said, is obedience and love. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. And you'll be loved by my Father, and we will come and make our home in you. We're talking about 2023. We're not talking about hype now. We're talking about having a vision of Jesus, whom I've suffered the loss of all things for, that I might gain him and know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. How do we keep our eye on that, practically speaking? Number one, every day we seek to grow in love. Maybe some of you married couples in here feel irritated with your spouse, and you're letting that irritation out in ways that are really destructive. The way you're talking to each other, not showing consideration to each other, not treating others with sensitivity and, and tenderness, coming out of your own struggle to be a blessing to your spouse, to show your love, to pray for them. This is growing in love. And then secondly, Jesus said, you'll obey. This is a, 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 a 24 hour a day focus obedience. I know that when we're sleeping, we're unconscious, but what I'm trying to tell us is that we need to sometimes take the, these concepts, for example, obedience out of like just specific things to recognize that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us all day. So our ears are always attentive. We, we, we can't always discern what he's saying, but we're always trying to listen. And then when the Holy Spirit speaks, we need to be open and willing to hear him and to obey. The problem is, is that sometimes we're only willing to hear the Holy Spirit when he speaks to us what we want him to say. Right. It's true. It's like my parents said to my brother, sister, and I when we were growing up, the only thing you hear me say is when I say the word candy. If you said something else, we didn't even hear what they said. Candy? What? <laughs> How many times have you asked the Lord, a, 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 you want, you're looking for him to tell you something. You have a choice to make. Should I do this or should I do this? And you pray. And there's a struggle in you. Because you think you know what he wants you to do, but you really don't want to do it. So you say, well, Lord, what should I do? And if you sense the Lord tells you to do what you want him to tell you to do, if his will is what you want, then you're quick for obedience. But when you say to the Lord, Lord, what, what should I do? And you sense the Holy Spirit telling you to do the thing you don't want to do. What do you do? You pray again. Lord, what do you want me to do? <laughs> what do you want me to do, Lord? And you keep on doing it until you self-deceive yourself. You keep on asking until the Lord just takes his hand off you because you won't listen. 
And then a lying spirit comes and tells you to do what you want to do. Obey. Sometimes it's very direct. It's a word in Scripture that you need to apply to your life, and I need to apply to my life. Sometimes it's a word that comes to you through a concert, through a friend. You need to apply. You need to obey. Sometimes it's just the witness of the Holy Spirit. It's just like, you know, oh man, what is right. Do good. Show mercy. The Lord is just giving you an intuitive understanding of what the right thing to do is. Do it. Do it. There's no quicker way into power than to obey. God called Abraham to sacrifice his son. Abraham gave up the most important thing in his life to obey. And then after he did it, the Lord said, because you have done this thing, I will greatly bless you. Obedience brings blessing. We're talking about 2023. We're talking about love. We're talking about obedience. And finally today, I want to focus on being an overcomer. I want you to focus on loving better, stretching yourself more, being more sacrificial. Jesus laid down his life, the ultimate sacrifice, that we could receive life. He lived a life of obedience. He did whatever the Father showed him, he did. Sometimes it's the hard thing. It's not always going to be the easy thing. Straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Few are willing to go down that road. Save me, Lord. Save me, Jesus. Then thirdly, I want you to concentrate on 2023 is to be a year for each one of us individually of overcoming. Seven times in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, when Jesus was speaking to the church, he said, he that overcomes will inherit these things. Whether it's the paradise of God, being given a stone that no one else has, being given a name that only you and he know, all these special blessings are reserved for those who overcome. Now, what do we mean by overcome? We don't all start out at the same place in life. Some of us come from a much more healthy foundation than others. That's why we can't judge each other according to the flesh. Because this person didn't start out where this person did. This person might look better, but this person might have overcome a lot more. It's the person that's overcome the most that's going to receive the greatest reward. So let me ask you, what is it that you need to overcome in your life? And I know that as the year unfolds, there's going to be new things that you're going to have to overcome. But we need to overcome. Walking with Yeshua is leading a life of an overcomer. Whatever the challenge is, you have to thank God for the challenge because it's an opportunity to be made whole by clinging to Him through the challenge and to be made an overcomer. And as, you, as we cling to Him and overcome the challenges that we have, whether they're emotional challenges, maybe you're dealing with discouragement or depression. You know what? Praise God, you've got something to overcome. Doesn't mean it's easy, but there's always a way out. There's always a way through. There's always a path to victory. God has a banner of victory over our lives. He that's born of God overcomes the world. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I don't know what it is, but you know what? God's called you and I to overcome. If it's that eating problem, guess what? God's made you an overcomer. You've got to tackle that thing, one step at a time. If it's a relational problem, guess what? You can overcome that situation. You need wisdom for the Lord to show you by the Spirit how to function in that relationship. But you can overcome in that relationship, so at least you'll be able to be at peace with God and with yourself. If it's an emotional challenge that you're having, the Word of God gives you the tool to overcome. I remember I had a day I was feeling really discouraged. I looked out in the world, and I thought about where the world is going, and I just saw, man, like the world is going to hell in a handbag. The Christian culture is being snuffed out. 
Christianity is being crushed under the, the culture of the world's feet. And for someone like myself that's an evangelist that wants to reach the center of the earth to the uttermost stratospheres around the world with the gospel, I want to penetrate the entire earth with the good news of Jesus, and yet I see the media cutting us out so that we don't have a voice. I just laid down one day, I just was so discouraged with where I saw things going, and then thinking about the world that my grandkids are being raised in and that my kids are in getting older in life. I laid down one day, I said, Lord, where, where, where's the joy? Where's the, where's the happiness? I don't really see any path forward with this. I don't see things getting better around me. I see things getting harder. Probably get more wrinkles on my skin. Can't do some of the physical things that I used to. The amount of open doors in front of me seem to be closing, like I said, with the shutting down of the Christian voice, the dismal situation in politics, and the jaded poison that has come upon our society, the divisiveness and the hatred. And I laid down, I was so discouraged. I said, Lord, where's happiness? Where's happiness, Lord? I'm so tired. But I kept praying, talking to God. I was so thankful just to be able to talk to God about it. What a blessing just to be able to talk to God about it. And after I was laying down for about 45 minutes, the Spirit brought clarity to me. I'm your happiness. I am your happiness. It's not here, it's not there, it's not anywhere. I myself am your happiness. You know, I got up from that place as an overcomer. I didn't overdose. I found Jesus. <laughs> Let's stand. <laughs> so as we're closing the service today, my friends, vision. Jesus is our vision. Be thou my vision. Remember our senior saints, that old song, be thou my vision. Beautiful song. And then focus. We got to stay focused on the vision. Our beautiful sister Nina was telling me the other day that she was dealing with some things. She noticed her mind started to drift. You know what she did? She went and picked up some Christian literature. She realized, you know what? My mind's going in a direction I don't want it to go. I'm going to take charge over that, and I'm going to direct my mind. I'm going to pick up some Christian literature and start reading the Word. Focus, staying focused. And then action steps. Somebody said to their father, I don't know who I am. And the father said to him, well, if you do something, you know who you are. You've got to do something. We've got to act in Jesus. We've got to be that witness. We've got to open our mouth. We've got to take action and do what he's calling us to do. And then finally, we want to take a hold of the concept, beloved ones, of discipline. Remember, discipline is doing the hard thing when the feeling of wanting to do it goes away. But we're called to walk not by feelings, but by the Word and the Spirit of eternity. We apply this concept in loving, stretching ourselves, coming out of our own emotions, coming out of just connecting to people when we want to, or connecting with the people that we like or that make us feel good, to just showing love for humanity in a greater way, loving, growing in that capacity. And then in obedience, recognizing that Jesus is Lord. The Bible says if we believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess that He's Lord will be saved. But I think that what the Spirit is saying there is we're not just confessing that Jesus is Lord, we're basically confessing that He's our Lord. That He's our Lord. That we're under His Lordship. That our life does not belong to ourselves. I wonder if, as I close this morning, if our ministers of impartation could come. We're talking about obedience here. Ministers of impartation, if you'd come, please. I wonder today, when we talk about obedience, I wonder how many of us today have really never, ever, truly come to a place in life 
where we've come to the realization that our lives do not belong to ourselves. Have you ever come to that place where you realize it's not about you? That our lives belong to Him. That we're His servants. Jesus told the story about someone that had done what they were commanded to do. And Jesus said that person shouldn't even expect anything. All he's done is what he was commanded to do. Do we have that kind of mindset that we're under truly the Lordship of Hashem, of God in our lives? Do we live like that? It makes it easier to do the right thing. I think even last night, it was cold last night when we came from Pastor Matthew and Tabitha's this home. I mean, it wasn't that cold, but it was cold enough for me. I was cold. And all of a sudden, Cynthia looks at her her uh, gauge in the car she was driving the tire pressure was low and I knew that Cynthia was going to be driving back to Columbus alone tomorrow because I'm, I'm traveling and I thought oh man look at that it's freezing outside I could either have let Cynthia deal with it today but no I'm working on growing in love working about co coming out of my own flesh I said hon we got to take care of this tonight go over to the gas station there I need to fill up these tires she said you want to, you want to do that I said no I don't want to do it I got to do it <laughs> but it was a stretch in my old days I would have said oh yeah it's kind of cold tonight It'd be easier tomorrow but no I'm going to take care of my wife I'm going to lay down my life for my wife I'm going to grow in love I'm going to stretch I'm going to be a servant but you know what that takes initiative that takes effort that takes sacrifice that's painful it's not the easy thing we've got to grow in love and we've got to grow in obedience how is that obedience because I could have said to myself Lord do you really want me to do that Lord, no I'm serious I could have talked myself I, I could have, I could have seen myself in the olden days talking myself out of it because I was more in the flesh than in the spirit Lord you want me to do that I don't know Lord I have to, let me look at the weather forecast tomorrow. Maybe it can be a little sun out tomorrow. <laughs> right? But no, I obeyed. Obeyed. And then finally, discipline. Again, we keep harping on the same thing every day. If you don't begin the day with God, you're not going to end the day with God. I mean, I know that might be a bit of an overstretch, but there's a lot of truth in it. And then talking to him all day, inviting him in. I want to close with this statement. Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. And if any man hears his voice and invites him in, he will come in. We all know that verse. We use it as a salvation verse. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart and knocking. If you receive him into your life, he'll save you. But it's much more than a salvation verse. Because you know what? He's continually knocking because he wants to come deeper. And we're going to look at that at the Song of Songs next time I'm here, Lord willing. She brought him into the room where she was born in. She brought him in to the deepest foundations of her identity, her life, her thoughts, her hopes, her dreams. Today, beloved ones, as we think about this, 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 this concept of Jesus standing at the door of our heart and knocking, will you continue to receive him as Lord? Will you obey him and will you overcome? Because he that overcomes will inherit everything that he has to offer. You're here today, and I really felt a weight on the statement that I made just two moments ago when I said there are some here today, and you've never really come to a place in your life and in your identity where you've recognized that your life, it's not your own. It isn't. We think we're, we're still living lives as if our lives are our own. And we're choosing what we want and what we don't want. And we make it about us. We have to give up our rights and recognize our lives are not our own to decide. Our only goal in life is to yield and obey and love Him and submit to Him. Today may be a year. Today might be the day that God draws that Jordan River for you to step over so that as we're entering 2023, you're starting out on a new foundation. You're moving forward from a foundation, beloved ones. That this year does not belong to you. It belongs to the Lord. That He's the Lord over your life. And if you'll make that decision to truly yield yourself up, to allow Him to be your Lord, to give Him the right to tell you what to do and be committed to obeying, 
to be willing to let go of that unforgiveness so that you can love. To not just obey Him when He tells you to do what you want to do, but to obey Him when it hurts. And to lead the life of an overcomer. If that is you today, I want you just to lift your hands and say, King of glory, come in. I make you my Lord.